This is the number that they engraved into. It's dot by dot burned into my flesh and skin. It means that they wanted to reduce me to just that number, but they could never do that. I will console those who mourn in Zion to give them beauty for ashes, the oil of joy for mourning, the garment of praise for the spirit of heaviness, that they may be called oaks of righteousness, the planting of Adonai, that he may be glorified. Shalom Chavarim, welcome friends to our program today. I'm Miles Weiss. And I'm Catherine Weiss, and welcome to our series, Beauty for Ashes. We're taking you to Poland, to Auschwitz, to show and to document the reality of the Holocaust. You know, there are people today that are Holocaust deniers, so we felt that it was very important to document the stories of the Holocaust survivors that are still alive today. And then, of course, we'll take you to what God has done by the rebirthing of the state of Israel. Yeah, you know, at the top of the program, we saw Ava Moses Kor. She is one of the amazing survivors that we were able to interview. Mm. And this story, the story of recovering from the Holocaust, mm. is the story, a long, long love story that is a story of survival and restoration, and it's really the beauty of the Lord. Think about this. How many cultures have tried to wipe out Israel over the centuries? I'm not sure you know. The Babylonians, the Persians, the Greeks, the Romans, the Byzantines, the Caliphates, the Crusaders, the Mamluks, the Ottoman Empire, the Turks for 400 years, and also the British occupied Israel, and yet, They've all either faded from history or taken a back seat for a season, and Israel stands. I think about what Mark Twain said, what is the secret of his immortality? Speaking of Jewish people, it is the God yes. of the Jewish people. Yeah. And this promise goes back to Genesis. This is not something that happened right. in 1948. Genesis 15, the Lord promised to Abraham and his descendants the land from the river in Egypt to the river Euphrates. Mm. And we still have not seen that land come to us, but the fact is that God is on the move and God has a great promise yeah. for Israel and for those of you who are grafted in to the Commonwealth of Israel. Right. So let's go now and hear more from Miles in Poland. here inside Auschwitz-Birkenau, Birkenau itself, where the so-called Jewish ramps were here. This is where the selection took place, who would live for a short time, who would die immediately. This was where 70% of the Jews that came through here were exterminated immediately. This is where Joseph Mengele, Dr. Joseph Mengele from the Bavarian Mengele family, a uh, dynasty, a wealthy dynasty, 32 years old, wounded war hero, sent here to oversee the selection and to oversee these experiments that would take place on the Jewish people primarily and also on gypsies and others. He was known as the angel of death because he had the power from the moment people came off the cattle cars where they were packed in 80 or more to one car, standing for days without water, without food, without sanitation, some died in the cars, when they would be rushed out here and hounded forward by dogs and barking people, they would then be selected by Mangala. And Mangala would say, you go this way to live, they didn't know that, and you go this way to the gas chamber. They didn't know that either because this whole thing was founded on continual deception. 
If you were 16 to 40 years old, you had a chance to live, but you had to look healthy. If you were an old person or a baby or a child under the age of 16, you would li most likely be sent immediately to the gas chambers. The idea was to keep the healthier looking people alive long enough to be worked to death here doing work for the Germans in stealing the wealth of the Jews, sending it to Germany, and then reducing the people into less than human artifacts that could then be plundered. Gold teeth, clothing, hair, anything that the, that the Germans, the Nazis could take was taken from the people here before they went to the gas chamber and then to the crematorium. Now, in an irony that I will never fully understand, Mengele was looked upon as a, uh, for a moment, as a heroic figure because the level of desperation and the level of deception when the people would come off the cars, he was here, handsome, tall, straight, with his gleaming uniform and with this very cool demeanor was able to decide between life and death. The other irony I will never fully understand is at the end of the war, the Americans kept him for one month, and then he made his way to South America and lived the rest of his life running from place to place in South America. Certainly, the Israelis hunted him. Simon Wiesenthal hunted him. But Mengele, with the help of the wealth of his family and the German-led government of Paraguay, was able to avoid capture and died of a stroke while swimming in South America. In 1979, he died, and his body was unearthed and verified in 1985. So here we have the angel of death responsible for untold horror, untold misery to the Jewish people, and he survived the camps. The only way to understand this is to recognize that there is good and there is evil. And we need to be people of the book on the side of good. Auschwitz was first established in the summer of 1940 to house Polish political prisoners. Less than two years later, Auschwitz-Birkenau was receiving transport trains packed full of Jewish people destined for extermination. In 1944, almost a year before the camp was liberated, 10-year-old Ava Moses and her family stepped off a transport train and onto the selection platform. She shares with us her memories of what happened when the train arrived at Auschwitz. And eight, eight hours later, the train stopped. We again asked for water, and this time there was no answer in any language. We heard a lot of Germans yelling orders outside. And then the cattle car doors opened and thousands of people poured out onto a strip of land called the selection platform. Well, it was the biggest, most confusing place that I have ever experienced. Shoving, pushing, falling, people were grabbing at one another. Nobody, absolutely nobody understood what was going on and what that place was. We did not know that we arrived in Auschwitz. There was no welcoming committee to announce that. We are trying to look around, trying to figure out what this place is. And so we are standing there on that actual selection platform. My mother and Miriam and I never moved away from our cattle car. And the only way I can figure that out that my mother kind of leaned against our cattle car as it was standing there, or she felt that there was some safety staying there, I don't know. I am looking around in my childish curiosity. I actually turned around, looked all around to try to figure out what on earth is this place. And as I looked around, suddenly I realized that Daddy and my two older sisters were gone. 
No matter where I looked, I couldn't find them. They disappeared in the crowd in 10 minutes. So now we are holding on to mother for dear life. And then a Nazi guard is coming, yelling in German, twins, twins. Well, he, she or us did not volunteer any information. You wouldn't volunteer in a place you don't even know what the place is, much less. Why? So he noticed us. We were dressed alike, we looked alike. He demanded to know from my mother if we were twins. And my mother said, is that good? The Nazi nodded yes, and my mother said yes. That moment, another Nazi came, pulled my mother immediately to the right, we were pulled to the left, and I never even got to say goodbye to her. I can tell you one thing. I was so stubborn and usually so determined that if I knew that this was going to be the last time we would see her, I would have tried to run back and say goodbye to her or to carry on some kind of a action. But by the time I realized she was gone. We were pulled in one direction. We became part of a group of little girls, all twins. In our group, there were 13 sets of twins between the ages of two and 16. That is the way we were kept in our barracks according to age and sex. We were in a barrack that had about maybe 200, 300 kids. Some of them have been there for a month or two or three or even longer. And what I experienced was that all the other kids wanted to inform us about everything that was going on in the camp. It was like going to a summer camp where everybody knows what's going on and the rest of the kids want to fill you in. Because one of them said to me, this first night, well, said, people are being burned here because I, maybe I have made some reference to the smell. Because I, don't you know, people are burned here to death. And I said, excuse me, burning people? Yeah, they want to burn out the Jews. She was like, very matter of fact, how come you don't understand that? I said, that is crazy, that's not possible. Because the mind cannot really comprehend it. So she asked us, Miriam and me, to go to the direction of the gas chamber, which was toward the west from where we were, and opened the back door and said, look toward the sky, what do you see? And you could see flames leaping from chimney to chimney was like this kind of thing. And I said to her, that's crazy. What are they burning so late at night? She said, I told you, they're burning Jews. The chimneys after every transport that comes, the chimneys burn day and night. They want to kill all the Jews. I said, the whom? They said, she said, the old people, children. And I said, uh-uh, we are children. They are not burning us. And I thought I was pretty clever about it. She said, notice that all of us are twins. There is a doctor by the name of Mengele. You will meet him tomorrow if you haven't met him today. And he's the one who does the experiments. I didn't know, quite know what to do with that. Ava and her sister were chosen for survival, but they were really chosen for experimentation. It's a miracle that they both survived mm -hmm. the camp. And 
you can see through her story the interplay between the, like you say, the three spirits at work in the world. There's the mm -hmm. spirit of God, right. the spirit of anti-God, and the human spirit. And the, the fact is that, that human will plays a part in all of these things. God didn't cause this to happen, but humans cooperated with the darkness in this world in order to make these things happen. And I think mm -hmm. about how uh, Yeshua's friend Peter, he spoke of the, the the enemy of our souls like a roaring lion seeking whom may, he may devour in 1 Peter 5, 8. But he also said in 2 Peter 3, 9 that God is not willing that any should perish, but all come to everlasting life. Wow. There's more to come back after this. We hope you are enjoying our series, Beauty for Ashes, as we contrast the horrors of the Holocaust with the miracle of modern Israel. Get this series for yourself or to share with friends. Just call us at 1-800-WONDERS or go to levitt.com and ask for the DVD series, Beauty for Ashes. You know, from these spots, you see how beautiful the land of Israel is and how beautiful the people are themselves. You know, there's a call that's going over all of the earth that we would gather to Him in these last days, and Jerusalem will be the place that Yeshua returns to. I hope that you come with us and that you see that where our Messiah will return. Now, we're going to go back to Israel, and we're going to see Miles in Caesarea, and he seems to be enjoying himself. Don't touch that dial. I know what you're thinking. What is Miles Weiss doing at Pebble Beach, California? Well, we are in Israel at the world-class golf course here in Caesarea, as they say here, Caesarea. Not far from here is Herod's Port. Herod the Great built the port of all ports in his era. It is the place that is full of history. It's the place where kingdoms are in conflict, where not only did Gladiators die and, 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 and prisoners died in the arena, but also the gospel went forth from nearby here. The gospel went around the world to the west and is arising in the east and is gathering strength in China, in Asia, South America, Africa, and is coming back to this land. But here we are in Caesarea on a golf course designed by Pete Dye, one of the most famous golf course designers. Now, the story of the restoration of Israel is the story of not only the many millions of small people making little contributions, but also some giant luminaries who contributed in order to make this land what it is today. We've come a long way from the gladiator fights to the battles here on the golf course. And it was Baron de Rothschild from France who first realized that it was his finances that were going to help produce changes in this land on a, on a monumental, monumental scope. For example, his wineries in France, he realized that things would not grow in the sand here in Israel, but wine was conducive. And so he brought his vineyards here. Some of his grape plants were brought here and be established the wineries in the north, established grapes that could be grown in sand. And so established and began a century ago the wine industry that is now flourishing here in Israel. Well, similarly, what can you do with sand? You can also build a golf course. You can design it, water it, and build it so that it becomes a place, a showpiece really, for something that is a picture of the, the growing restoration of Israel. Yes, it's about leisure, it's about rest, it's about relaxation, but it shows that this place, this country, is going in an antithetical process to what is the rest of the Middle East. In other words, we have here a democracy. We have here an economy that is thriving. We have here a, a desire to see strength and health and peace and, and recreation and rest. All those things take place here in this land. 
as opposed to the conflicts that are fomented around the Middle East and all the other nations. Remember, this is the only democracy, true democracy, in the Middle East. Rothschild says something very interesting. He said, without me, the Zionists could do nothing. But without the Zionists, my work would have been dead. As a great man, he recognized that it was the working together of the visionaries of this land, the restoration of this land, the looking forward to what could be here, as well as his financial help, his desire to be part of that restoration. And I think uh, in a humorous but very interesting way, no question that this golf course at Caesarea speaks about an Israel that you will not see on CNN, but you can see here on Zola Levitt Presents. Greetings from Israel. We're here at Caesarea, the port that Herod the Great built in order to duplicate his comfortable Roman living here in the middle of what was at the time nowhere in Judea and along the Maritime Sea here, along the Mediterranean. He was determined to provide for his soldiers and for the Romans in the area a duplication of life in Rome, a near impossibility, right. but he managed to come very close. Yeah, didn't he? it's good to know that Herod the Great wasn't a great man, but right. he was a great architect. Yes. And he was a, a, just a very strong personality, and he was able to build things impossible things, and this is one of them. Masada is the other. Yes. It's an amazing accomplishment. It is, and, and the archaeologists have told me that they believe that Israel has only been 15% uncovered, which means that there's 85% more to find in this area. That's why you see school children, you hear the sound of the archaeologists working, the dig goes on and on. It's an incredible amount of work that needs to be done. And it says something about the connection of the Jewish people in the land and their desire to accomplish significant things. For example, some of the houses we've seen uh, in this area is related not only to the wealth of some of the people in the land, but really to their desire to contribute, really to kun olam, right. to give back, to recreate the world, to repair the world. It's a drive in Jewish people. I hope that we're able to communicate to you the value of family and Jew Jewish life, yes. and that you see that it's one of um, Tukun Olam, yes. it's, it's repairing the world, it's making the world a better place. Yes, we see that throughout the area where the technology, the medicine, the breakthroughs are all tr attempting to be shared with the surrounding nations. Think about this. The Jewish people comprise 0.25% of the world population. But regarding the Nobel Prizes, the significant hard science-related Nobel Prizes, they, we have captured, the Jewish people have captured 22% of those prizes. Listen to some of these statistics. In chemistry, 19% of the world prizes. Economics, 39%. Literature, 13%. Medicine, 28%, and physics, 26%. A tremendous amount of accolade and yeah. acknowledgement for accomplishments that are coming through the Jewish people in fulfillment of the prophetic word that through you, Abraham, yeah. Isaac, and Jacob, who is Israel, through you, all the, all nations, the nations of the world would be blessed, all the families of the world. So little people, ordinary people doing big things, and also big people like Rothschilds, whose financial breakthroughs, whose strength as a banker allowed him to become so wealthy that he could help to rebuild this country. I also want to put to death once and for all the, the lie, the anti-Semitic lie about Jewish people and money. The reason why Jewish people were in banking is not because of some nefarious deeds or some ability to outfox people. The reason why they were trusted with the wealth of Europe was because of their trustworthiness. And the heads of state, those who had wealth knew that they could count on the stability, the sanity, the family values, and the reality of honesty with the Jewish people. And that's why people like Rothschild could become very wealthy and then help to rebuild this reborn state. You know, this area that we're in is, is actually, not only is it an ancient ruin, but it's also got modern ties. Mm. That, 
families come here, the children play, mm -hmm. they learn about their history, they learn that they are to be in this land, mm -hmm. they learn that they have a, have a, a destiny here. Yes. And uh, there's beautiful shops, there's beautiful restaurants, and there's a modern life going on right here in Caesarea. Yeah, so we want to invite you to join us here and find out what God is doing today in this miracle of Israel. Israel is such a land of diversity. You see me in, on a golf course in the middle of the country alongside the Mediterranean. There's snow skiing in the north. There's scuba diving in the south. And yet the entire country was birthed in this modern version right. out of the horrors mm -hmm. of the Holocaust. And it's because God has an intention, which is to prepare the world for the coming of Jesus. You know, Jesus himself said in John 4, 22, salvation is of the Jews. Mm -hmm. Isn't it amazing that the entire world is focusing on this little nation mm -hmm. and every day it's in the headlines and all this controversy around it. Well, that's to prepare people for the decision that nations and individuals have to make about the person and the Messiah. sovereignty of God. You know, it says in it says in Jeremiah 16, uh, 14, and 15 that it, the day will come that they will no longer be those that came up out of Egypt, mm -hmm. but that God brought them from the north, the south, the east, and the west, yes. restored them back to the land. Mm -hmm. We are witnessing a living miracle greater than what happened when God split the Red Sea. He has called his people back. They have restored the land. They have built the land and they have become his beautiful people. Yeah. Married I, to him. Yes. I think about the idea of chosenness and how horrifying it is that Mengele and his cohorts uh, took that choice and made, okay, you can live and you can die. So when sick. the idea of being a chosen people is chosen by God. Mm -hmm. You know, when, when I was a young man, and I was in summer camp in Broadway Productions, La Di Da, and the, I played Tevye, and he had that great line in Fiddler on the Roof where he said, God, I know we're the chosen people, but once in a while, could you choose somebody else? <laughs> because of the hardship right. that comes along with being a Jewish person. Mm -hmm. And yet in the midst of it, we feel this incredible unction that's coming, especially among the Gentile church, the church universal, mm -hmm. to look into these things and to be part of what God is doing. And yeah. we want that for you. We want you to know that God loves you and that he's for you and that he has a plan for your life as well. Well, we never like to close our program without reminding you, Shalu Shalom Yerushalayim. Pray for the peace of Jerusalem. Our monthly newsletter, The Levitt Letter, is free and full of insightful articles and news commentary from a messianic perspective. Visit levitt.com to find our newsletter, along with current and past programs, our television schedule, and much more. Don't forget to order this week's resource by calling 1-800-WONDERS, or you can purchase it from our catalog at levitt.com. Your donations to Zola Levitt Ministries help these organizations bless Israel. Please remember, Zola Levitt Ministries depends on tax-deductible donations from viewers like you. This has been a paid program by Zola Levitt Ministries.